If you are a guest here this morning or I haven't had the privilege of meeting you just yet, my name is Craig. I serve here as the, the lead pastor. I've been a little unwell with the flu over the last couple of weeks, so very thankful for, for Barry Lawrence that served last Sunday in the Word, bringing us the exposition uh, of Psalm 130, I believe, and just glad to be back with you this morning in church. I didn't have COVID, don't worry, you're not in threat, uh, but uh, I did certainly have the flu and that knocked me out for about a week or so. So for those that were praying for me, that were praying that I would recover, I really do appreciate that. We're going to, we're going to run across a scattering of texts here this morning because we're going to speak about holy convocation, holy convocation. Now, for some of you that grew up in more traditional kind of church cultures, that phrase probably has some, it has some meaning or density to it. But for those that are like me, who never grew up in church at all, uh, there's, really, there's really no comprehension of what a holy convocation is. And so we're going to speak a little bit about that this morning and see how God would speak to us through His Word, presence Himself here mightily in our midst, and grant us His grace. Let me start off with a text from 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15. Paul wrote this while he was imprisoned in Rome to his son in the faith, Timothy, who was pastoring the church at Ephesus, Paul said, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar and buttress of the truth. It may not have been very obvious to you this morning when you got out of bed and had your breakfast and had your six or seven cups of coffee and then got in the car and made, well, there's, that's just me, maybe the addicts in the room, but you, you made it here to church and you sat down and you got ready for the worship service, it may not have been obvious to you that what you were engaging in was a holy, ancient and historic exercise of grace. It is, it is apparent to me that many Christians feel like Attending church on Sundays is just really the rhythm of the Christian life. It's just kind of status quo. It's, it's what we do. And we're going to speak a little bit this morning about what it actually means to be the sacred assembly of God. It was no ordinary thing. It's no, it's no simple or, or inglorious thing for you and I to gather together on the Lord's day. It is something which the Lord God has ordained and is pregnant with a world of glorious promises. So just to, just to back this up again with some more Scripture, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 say this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting, verse 25 says, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, part of the challenge that I think Christians have uh, today, and maybe this has been the case for, for many generations, is oversimplifying what a church is, or oversimplifying what the church is, or, or underestimating what we, should, what we should think of when we think of the church. And, and more often than not, what I see is these, these false dichotomies become part, of our, they become part of our regular conversation. I just saw on social media recently someone had a, a post up and it was, it was, building, it was, it was building in popularity. And, and the post said, church is not something you go to, it's something you belong to. And people, they fawned, they loved it. It's not true. Church is both. The word church in the New Testament is used for the gathering like what we're literally doing now when we got together this morning, we turned up, we sat in our chair, we sang the songs, we amen the prayers, we, we listen attentively, I hope, to, to, to the message. This is, this is doing church. And in the New Testament, the, church is, the word church is also used for the church, the, the, the global, what we call the, the universal, the, the lowercase c Catholic church. Don't, don't have some PTSD when I say Catholic for those that maybe grew up in that tradition. What, what we mean by that is the church that, that spans geography and chronology. That's, that's the Latin root of the word Catholic. It just means universal. That's what the church is. A lot of people struggle to understand that when we talk about church, we're talking about the vast majority of things that we do. This building is appropriately called the church. I remember a pastor friend of mine uh, thought that he would correct me one day. I, many years ago, I was saying, you know, when we, when we turn up at the church, 
when we turn up to church and you said, well, hold up, Craig, just hold up a moment. We don't turn up to the church. The building's not the church. The church is the people. It's not true. The church is both. So, so I, would, I would encourage you, first and foremost, if, if all of your theology is coming from social media, then my encouragement to you is pick up a book and do some reading for, for the Lord's sake. Please try harder to, to get a better understanding of what exactly the Lord wants us to know and understand. But also don't think diminishing thoughts of what the church is. Some of you, maybe you've, maybe you've said things like this. Maybe you've, maybe you've, you've retweeted or, or shared or requoted whatever the nomenclature is for certain comments like this without realizing that the church is so grand all-encompassing. And when we use the word church, we could mean any one of these specific things. And this morning, we're going to dial into this idea of the gathering, holy convocation, the, the assembling of the people of God is the church. God creates worshiping creatures. Let me put it a different way for you. God has never created a creature that wasn't designed, baked into the wiring of that creature to be worshipful. This is how God designs. This is how God creates. All of creation is made to exalt Him and celebrate Him. And the abuse of this worship or the the redirection of worship is the essence of sin. That is the essence of original sin. Everything made by God is called by God to bow down to God. And when we, when we give over of our ultimate affections and when we anchor our ultimate identity in anything other than God, that is sin, it brings about dysfunction in our life and it contaminates us. This is how we understand that God creates creatures that are made to worship. So when we worship anything less than the one true God, when we are all at a heart level, guilty of varying forms and degrees of idolatry. Let me, let me say it again, because I know some of you have been thinking, I get, I get a pass on this. None of us do. None of us do. We are all at a heart level to varying degrees and at varying times, giving over of our maximal affection to things that do not deserve or have earned your heart. And this is the essence of idolatry. When we worship anything less than the one true God, it always devalues us. The God of Scripture, the Ancient of Days, is the only being worthy of worship. So far, for the Christians in the room at least, so far, so good. When we think about this worship that the Lord God calls us to, we understand that the Lord God has always called His worshiping creatures to gather in assembly. One of the phrases that the Old Testament uses for this is holy Convocation. If we want to update the language a little bit, we might call it a a sacred assembly. This is why I opened up our talk this morning and I said, don't think small, minimizing thoughts about what we're doing right now because God doesn't. God evaluates, God assesses, God considers what we are doing right now to a far more infinitely glorious degree than we naturally do. Part of it is, we're feeble humans. So, so we turn up to church and, and it becomes so routine for us. It becomes so status quo for us. Part of the challenge we face is we don't think a lot of it. So my main objective here this morning is to help every one of us leave this building with a much more grand view of what it means when we gather as the people of God on the Lord's day. Sacred assembly simply means an assembly that is set apart. Holy convocation means a gathering that has been been allocated special, holy, divine importance. We go right back into the New Testament. We're going to do a bit of a, as I said, a bit of a survey of various texts. If you feel up to the challenge, you can try and keep up. If, if, If you don't, that's fine. This Message is recorded and it'll be available on YouTube over the next day or so. You can go back and watch it again. Some people say, Craig, you talk so fast, I can't take notes. I get it. I'm not trying to talk fast, but here's the reality. I could preach for three hours, but you'd all complain, so let's condense it into 45 minutes. 
And then later on, you can watch it on YouTube. And I, I, I'm familiar with a setting on YouTube where you can halve the speed and then it will sound like I'm talking at a normal speed. So let's, let's make a deal, right? From now on, no one needs to pull me aside and say, listen, Craig, uh, it's the speed that you speak at that bothers me because now you have a recourse for that. Grab the sermon off YouTube, put it on half speed and take your notes when you have the opportunity. Uh, the rest of us do want to get out here sometime today, not to belittle or devalue this, but uh, three-hour sermons certainly aren't the order of the day. Exodus 25, verse 8, the Lord God makes a promise to the exiles that are, that are being exiled out, exited out of Egypt. That's why the book's called Exodus. The, the Hebrews had been enslaved for four centuries and now being delivered under God's mighty hand through the agency of Moses and Aaron, and when God brings them out, he covenants with them to assemble with them and to dwell with them in power and in significance. Exodus 25, 8, this, is, this particular refrain of God is repeated many times. Let me give you one sampling. And let them make me a sanctuary, God says, that I may dwell in their midst. When the sanctuary had been constructed, we understand that the, the first iteration of that was a was a tabernacle. It's a form of a tent that the, that the slaves had to, as they had to walk around the wilderness for 40 years, they would, they would pack up the tent and, and walk and then set it up and, and worship. And this would be the pattern year after year for 40 full years. When they finally entered into the promised land, they made something of a permanent structure under King Solomon of the temple, which replaced the tabernacle. But now God had called his people to establish a place, a unique, special place, a, a sanctuary. It comes from the word sanctify. It means to be set apart and made of special use. Some examples of holy convocations that existed in the Old Testament. Some of you may know of these. Some of you probably don't. was weekly Sabbath gatherings. Leviticus 23, 2 to 3 says this, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. So as we try and wrap our head around, what it might have been like to live in that generation, in that experience, we realize that these holy convocations, they, they, they dotted the Hebrew calendar with special occasions. There was a once a week separation of one day in seven set apart for God for rest and worship. The next gray festival, in fact, probably the second biggest of them all, was Pentecost. All of Israel was commanded to gather at the tabernacle, or when the temple would be constructed for the Feast of Pentecost. The largest in the calendar. If you want the reference for that, that's Leviticus 23, 21. The largest festival, without doubt, is Passover, recorded in Exodus 12, 16, and Leviticus 23, 7. The Feast of Weeks, Tabernacles and Trumpets, three different feasts. I'll give you the references in case you're trying to note these down. Numbers 20, 28, 26, and 29, 1. Leviticus 23, 35, and 36, and 23, 24. The Feast of Unleavened Bread called for two holy convocations, one on the first day and the other on the seventh day. So the, the week was bookended with holy sacred assembly. And every year, on the tenth day of the seventh month, was Day of Atonement. Israel was commanded to fast on this day, to gather at the tabernacle or temple. This was called the Holy Convocation. Recorded in Leviticus 23, 27 and Numbers 29, 7. Now, now, looking at all these, because just for a moment there, it was easy for some people to kind of check out. It got a little bit technical for a few moments. But, but what is consistent with all of these holy convocations? What's essential for us to, to grasp out of all of these as far as just being a history lesson? What are, we, what are we seeing? What's the pattern that is emerging is a specified day. Each one of these events happens on a specified, divinely appointed day. It's not, it's not taking a vote every year to see when's everyone available, set your date in the calendar, and we'll have the feast on that day. It's 
God sets the calendar. It's specified. Number two is each one of these were to be a, a day of rest. A day of rest and, and specifically worship and rejoicing and thankfulness. Each one of these days was meant to mark something significant about God's work of redeeming them. The next thing we see is the pattern emerges is the set times of sacred assembly were always occasioned by offering. Offering. In fact, it's codified in Old Testament law. You don't come to the tabernacle or the temple unless you've brought an offering with you. The ancient Israelites would never dream of approaching God's presence without bringing some token of their gratitude and, and appreciation. As we trace the history here, and some of you really wish that we wouldn't because you're not, not history fans, but, but I love the history here, and I know at least a few of you do. When we think about the New Testament, what is, what is holy convocation? What is sacred assembly? In other words, what we're doing right now, what does this have anything to do with reading about these Old Testament ceremonies and, and feasts and sacred days? But between New Testament experience and Old Testament example stands a towering figure which had more to do with the way that we regulate our worship today than any of the apostles of the New Testament. I, I dare say if we polled the crowd, the audience here this morning, very few of you could guess who I might be speaking of. The man's name, who rarely gets sufficient enough credit for all that God used him for, was Ezra. Ezra was a tower. Excuse me, some of my flu is still remaining. <coughs> it's okay, we'll edit that out totally. We'll be gone. We'll be gone from your memory. Ezra is a towering figure that God used to establish the pattern of worship. Very few Christians in our day and age actually appreciate who Ezra was or what he did. I mean, outside of the fact there's an Old Testament book named Ezra, so he must have been something of a significant guy. We take for granted what Ezra did to establish. Now, just to give you something of his CV, of his resume, if you will, we're going to go into how he impacted New Testament worship in a moment. But just to give you a sense that, that the, the fact that you hold a Bible, I hope you're holding a Bible, those that are holding a Bible in your hand. In other words, you have all of the sacred books divinely inspired by God compiled together. You may not be aware the first person to do that was Ezra. That was his idea. The fact that you've got a Bible in your hand, or maybe, well, I've got an iPad or a smartphone, and I can just pull up an app. Yes, but still the fact that they're all brought together in a compendium of resource, it's Ezra. Not only that, Ezra compiled all of the worship songs of ancient Israel and put together the, the hymn book. The, the fact that we have a book of Psalms in our Bible, it's because of Ezra. More than that, Ezra regulated and established worship in what we call the Second Temple period, without trying to give you all the history to this, because I realize that my particular interest in history is not always shared communally, but the Second Temple period is because the first temple that Solomon built was utterly vanquished and destroyed by the Babylonians. And then the return with Ezra and Nehemiah and these particular Bible characters brought them back from captivity into the Promised Land they began to build and establish a new temple. Many other things Ezra did, aside giving us the book of Psalms, giving us a, a collection we call our Bible, giving us the book of First and Second Chronicles. He wrote that. That was his recording of the history of Israel. Ezra regulated what worship would look like. He took the lead and arranged local assemblies, which began to use the Greek word, You'll know this word, although you don't know that you know it. The Greek word is synagogue. Synagogue. It, means, it mean, just means gathering. It, it means assembling. It was obviously very inconvenient and impractical to make all of the people of Israel pilgrimage to the temple, particularly every Sabbath day. That's probably a two, three day walk for so many people living in Israel. Ezra said, we've got to find a better solution. We can't make people leave their homes Thursday to arrive on Sabbath on Saturday, and then Sunday morning they walk them back, they get home Tuesday, they're home for one full day Wednesday, and then they're coming back. This is crazy, Ezra said. We began to establish small worshiping communities in the towns and the villages across Israel. 
called these synagogues. When you open your New Testament and you read about Jesus going into the synagogue on the Sabbath to read the Scriptures and to preach and to heal and, and, and conduct His ministry, you are reading the deposit of Ezra upon the nation of Israel. And God appointed this. Ezra bridged the gap. He established assemblies around teaching of Torah and giving of the alms in local assemblies. We could trace this practice of the Lord further back into history. In fact, some would rightly argue that God's unique presence for sacred assembly predates even the Exodus. We read this way back in Genesis chapter 3, in the first experience of Adam and Eve. After they'd eaten of the forbidden fruit, Genesis 3, 8 says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. What we see here, even though the whole affair is couched around the event of human fallenness and frailty and the weakness of Adam and Eve, is that God seems to be gathering with them in a very unique way. On a daily basis, God's purposes to gather especially and uniquely with His people has been His purpose forever, since at least He created them and eternally on into the future. Now, someone might say, well, we read a lot of Old Testament already this morning and we traced the the holy convocations and the sacred assemblies of the Old Testament, but... We don't really see much of that in the New Testament, right? I mean, we're not under law, we're under grace. You ever hear that phrase? We're not under law, we're under grace. Well, some of that's partly true, but the predominance of that is mostly wrong. Matthew 18 verse 20 says, Jesus' promise is where there are two or more gathered in my name, there am I among them. There am I among them. You know what this means? That you can have the most amazing worship time experience, driving in your car with your worship music playing, serving Jesus, singing to Jesus. You could convert your car into a rolling cathedral, right? Don't close your eyes and raise your hands, but pay attention to the road. But it's never going to quite be the same thing as when you gather with the people of God. You, you, you can be at home and, and, and you can sit out back. Sometimes I like to do this. And, and if it's cold enough, you can light a little fire and sit around it. And I get my phone and I put my favorite worship music on, usually just something instrumental. And I have wonderful times with Jesus, but it is nothing compared to the presence that He grants graciously when we are together. This is so essential to New Testament Christianity. A part of my burden here this morning is to at least in some degree undo the individualism which has pervaded Christian churches today. The assumption that what we're doing right now is really just something that we're doing right now and we can have just as good a worship experience by ourselves later on and it's either or. That's not New Testament Christianity. 1 Corinthians 5.4, Paul said this to the church at Corinth, When you assemble in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus. It was clear in Matthew 18, in Jesus' words, it's clear in the Corinthian experience that the apostles laid down for the Christian churches in the New Testament that they would have set times and seasons of gathering where God's presence would be uniquely evident. Let me read that text again. 1 Corinthians 5.4 When you're assembled in the name of the Lord with the power of the Lord Jesus. And you may sit there and think, well, Craig, you know, honestly, I turned up today. It was sort of, it was sort of touch and go for a while there, but, but I made it. I rolled into the parking lot. I, I came in, I sat down, and I've been sitting here for more, close to an hour, and I really haven't felt anything special happen. Well, that's not up to you. That's never going to be gauged by your sensory perception. It's always going to be dependent upon the covenant promises of God. Whether you feel it or know it or are aware of it, God has uniquely presenced Himself here this morning in a way that you can't replicate or manufacture in any other context. Yes, Christians need Sunday worship. Yes, church is absolutely essential. In case someone wasn't sure where I stand on that. 
We read this earlier. We'll read it again. Hebrews 10, 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What's compelling about this text in Hebrews chapter 10 is that these particular Christians were being viciously, mercilessly hunted down by a Roman government that wanted to destroy them and wipe them off the face of the earth. And there was one way the Roman government detected that they could find where these Christians were. That is to find out where they worship on the Lord's day. And now, the author to the, to the epistle to Hebrews, I believe this is a, a Pauline epistle. You may differ with me on that. That's, that's totally fine. But the author to the Hebrews is telling them, even though you know that turning up to church on Sunday, you are at risk of execution by a pagan government, don't neglect the meeting of yourselves together. It's not a challenging statement. Put in the context of the environment that these worshippers lived in. So we go back and think about Ezra, had the practice of establishing local communities of word and worship around the formal use of the word synagogue. You might be surprised, you might not be surprised, but that's literally the word used here in Hebrews chapter 10. Episynagoge, the gathering, the Greek, the, the assembling of yourselves together. Prioritize the gathering on the Lord's day, not because when you go you feel different, or when you leave you feel changed, or how your sensory perception interprets what goes on here as we gather. Gather on the Lord's day because God has promised, God has promised on the basis of His character, that he will meet with you uniquely, specially, powerfully. This is another part of the problem of what I consider to be the plague of modern Christianity. We often get our, our minds in this kind of rut of thinking that if we don't feel it, nothing's happening. We don't, if we don't immediately experience it, God's not doing anything. We, we often doubt God. We throw up our hands and say, where are you, God? God says, I'm exactly where I promised I would be. I promised that I would meet with you. I would be especially present among you when you gather. The New Testament assemblies, we call them churches, is rooted and grounded in the Old Testament pattern of the assembly. This is why the author to the epistle of the Hebrews uses the same word, synagogue, for the Christian assembly. Now, skipping ahead because I've got pages of notes that I'm just going to race past, is what makes it different. How, how does what we're doing this morning, the gathered people of God, the church, how does what we're doing this morning differ from the Old Testament example? Because we know that we're not doing Old Testament worship. It's pretty obvious if you know much about Old Testament worship, that's not what we're engaging in. And also, some will protest, God, God, God is present with us all the time. I remember having a, a young budding theologian uh, pull me aside and say, you know, Craig, I'm just, I'm really confused about this because the Bible talks about God uniquely presencing himself in certain occasions and situations, but, but God's omnipresent. So, so how does a God who's literally present everywhere in the most exhaustive possible sense, how does that God then covenant to uniquely present himself in special occasions and times and seasons? But the promise in the book of James, as you, many of you know it, is draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. It's not a trick. It's not a trick. It's like draw near to God. God's like, ha, 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 joke's on you. I'm everywhere, right? That's not, that's not what's happening, right? There's, there, we read in the Psalms that God says, in my presence there is joy. At my right hand there are treasures forevermore. We don't read that and say, wait, hold up, God. You, yeah, I'm not going to be fooled by this. I'm a, I'm a good theologian. I already know that you're everywhere. So everywhere is your presence and, and your right hand is literally the circumference of all reality. I already know that, God. What God is saying is that he has the ability to pour out something special and unique about his personal presence in certain occasions and environments that otherwise is not true. The Bible gives us plenty of examples, which we won't delve into this morning. But the apostles understood this. The apostles understood that God had earmarked 
a unique day that would be called the Lord's Day. So, so what doesn't continue from the Old Testament example, is what they would have set, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but they would have separated as the Saturday is the Sabbath. However, Jesus didn't rise from the dead on a Saturday. He rose on Sunday. And then when Jesus first met with his disciples, you go back into the gospel records and read this, when he first met with the disciples after his resurrection, it was the first day of the week. And he met with them again and it was the first day of the week. And many of these, of these first converts to Christianity in the first century were law-abiding Jews who still kept synagogue on Saturday and the Christian worship on Sunday. Don't ever buy into or believe the load of rot of people that tell you Sunday worship is the mark of the beast instituted by the Roman Empire under Constantine. That is so ahistorical. It's quite comedic. I expected you all to burst into laughter at that foolishness. Thank you. Same four people. Appreciate it. I'm here all week. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 10, which most scholars suggest the book of Revelation is one of the last books written in the New Testament. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, what does the Apostle John describe his experience? Of the whole revelation, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Well, this is curious, uh, because if you know much about John's story, John wasn't on the Isle of Patmos just taking a vacation. He was on the Isle of Patmos because he had been arrested by the Roman authorities, and they tried to execute him. Historic tradition is, in fact, that uh, Caesar was so enraged by this John the Apostle that he threw him in a large boiling vat of oil. I don't know why, but because of God's miraculous power, John wasn't even harmed by it. The the record of of tradition is that he's just swimming around. And the emperor is terrified by this. It says, we can't kill this guy. Uh, We killed Peter. We killed Paul killed James. We don't know what's wrong with this guy. And so they exiled him to hard labor on the Isle of Patmos, where for six 15-hour days, he broke rocks and broke his back as an elderly old man. But there was one day in seven where he worshipped. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So we are here on the Lord's day In the Spirit, we are worshiping people gathered on the Lord's day in spirit. Let me me speak a little bit just for a few minutes as we close here this morning. What happens here on a Sunday? What happens when we gather? Not what do we feel or what do we feel like we're personally experiencing, but what has God spoken of? Firstly, our family is uniquely present with a purpose and a mind to draw near to God. There is power in that alone. Secondly, some of you may not even be aware of this, but according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 10, every Lord's Day where the saints, the, the believers assemble, which we're doing now, God commissions and mobilizes angels to bear witness, to be present in the assembly. Let me give you the text here. This is what Paul wrote to the Corinthians, this very vague phrase. He says, This is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Commentators and scholars will (laughs) will debate that for centuries. But what has never been debated is the truth that the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians when you gather together on the Lord's Day, God commissions angels, emissaries from heaven, to be present in the worshipping assembly. Uh, John Calvin, the great systematic theologian of the Reformation, he wrote this, he said, God has pleased to give angels the charge of our safety, and hence they attend our sacred meetings, and the church is to them like a theatre which they behold the manifold wisdom of God. Isn't that an awesome thought? Again, you just, you just strolled in today, rolled into the parking lot, didn't think much of it, But this morning in heaven, there were angels that were saying, Lord, I'd love to go to Journey today. I know you're going to, you're going to, you're going to partition us to different churches and assemblies all, all over the world. And God commissioned angels to be here right now. Don't look around. You can't see them. He's like, wait, what? 
God's power is uniquely present. This is the promise of Jesus. Where there are two or more gathered, there am I in the midst of you. Present powerfully among you. The great Baptist preacher Charles Spurgeon used to speak about the power of the gathered assembly where God's Word becomes uniquely charged with God's gracious power. What that means is, yes, you can skip church and and, and just watch the live stream. Yes, you can skip church and just watch the sermon video later on. Someone's going to do that and you're like, he's talking about me. Yes, I'm talking about you. You can do that. And the Word of God is still true and still powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, but you have missed out of being in the environment where God's work works its most powerful work. I should think so. Yes. Charles Spurgeon used to say this. I started to talk about Spurgeon, then I kind of got on a tangent for a moment there. Charles Spurgeon used to say this. He used to say, there is no environment more powerful for bringing souls to salvation and faith than the gathered assembly. He, he, he described it as being a lot like, a lot like he said, when, when you take seeds and you go out into your garden and you plant the seeds, and I already don't have a clue what he's talking about, but some of you, you like gardening, so you know what this is like. He said you grab your garden hose and you could water the ground. He said, but it, it's, it's no substitute for when rain begins to actually fall in a natural way from the clouds above us. Spurgeon speculated and said there's something about that. He said it's like all nature knows when the, when the ambient pressure begins to change and the clouds' color begins to change and the sun begins to get hidden. All of the botanic nature begins to know that rain comes and they, they it's almost, Spurgeon says, and he was very poetic, so he said it's like the, the grass begins to look upward and await, the flowers begin to rise, the leaves begin to stand at attention. So we could water with a hose all day and we'll never get the same result. But he said it's like that with the preaching of the Word. Yes, you can download the podcasts. You can watch the sermons on YouTube. You can read the commentaries and the Bible studies and you can do all those things. But the Word of God will never quite have the effect on you as it does in the gathered assembly where angels are present and God's special presence is evident. So what is it for us? What does the Scripture call of us? To turn up? Yeah, that's like, that's entry-level commitment, right? To be there. And if you've struggled to commit to be in church, as often as the doors are open, you be there, then maybe this is just the, this is just the best reminder for you today. You will not grow in God as much as His will for you is to grow, or His presence and power and means of grace are there to grow if you don't prioritize the holy convocation of the assembly of the saints. You just won't. You might think you will. You might feel like you can substitute it. But Scripture says otherwise. When we come, it is a time for us to give the fruit of our lips. Hebrews 13, 15 says, Through Him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips that acknowledge His name. So when we come, we bring the fruit of our lips. That means we sing. We worship. That means we, we amen the prayers if, if we do agree. If you don't agree with the prayer, don't just say amen. Sometimes we get so much into the rote habit of doing that, right? I remember I was at a, I was at a funeral. Again, another tangent. We don't got time for this, but I'll tell you this last story, right, real quick. Yeah? Okay. Same four people. <clears throat> I was at this funeral this one time, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a dear, dear family member of one of the church members of the church I was pastoring. And, uh, and, and it was a... It was a funeral of a, how do I delicately put this, of a Christian tradition that most of us would not recognize is biblical. Is that, that's safe, right? That's fair enough. And, uh, and so they were praying to, to things and people other than God. In fact, at one point during the service, someone began praying to the person in the casket. It was very bizarre. It was very bizarre. Some of you have been to funerals like that. I wasn't there to judge. I wasn't there to be critical. I was just present to support the family. Uh, but, but in our section, it was a well-attended funeral for all these people from our church, which was good to see, a, a good turnout, a show of force and, and support and, and compassion. But then these prayers would go up to like special saints and pe- family members that had passed away and sometimes to seemingly inanimate objects and maybe even animals and all these good Baptist people around me at the end of every prayer, amen. Like, hold up. We're agreeing with that? 
This, this is what amen means. Some of you never knew this, been coming to church all your life. It literally means truly, verily, let it be. It's basically you signing your name at the bottom of the prayer saying, God, that prayer is as if I myself prayed it. I agree with it. I sign my name to it. So this is what the fruit of the lips is. When prayers are offered up, particularly here from the platform at Journey Christian Church, we are asking you to amen them so that we collectively sign our name as that prayer soars to God and He answers in His covenant promises. We're called to love one another. This is why it says in Hebrews 13, 16, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. The whole argument of the book of Hebrews, we're not going to go into it this morning, is to tell these Hebrew Christians, that's why it's called the book of Hebrews, to not return to the old sacrificial system of Judaism. But what they are encouraged to do, true for all of us here today, is to press on into the sacrificial system of the new covenant, which is to love one another, to do good and to share what we have Because those sacrifices are pleasing to God. Worship and offering to God. And also when we gather, it's a time to receive. Mutual encouragement. The nourishment of God's presence. The Spirit and the Word. We assemble for ministry. And then we scatter for mission. With the promise and the commitment one to another. That where we have the ability to do so. We will reconvene on the next Lord's Day in the Spirit together to worship God in spirit and truth. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as we close out this discussion this morning around this amazing, all-glorious, God-edifying topic. As every head is bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you one more Scripture passage. My goal here this morning as I'd already suggested to you, was to help you to enlarge your thoughts of what it means when we gather as the people of God. To not have small thoughts. To not think insignificant things. To not pretend like this is just habit and routine and that's all it is. We have to understand that as God has declared that He will dwell amongst His people, right now, in this particular time of covenant grace, This is how God especially meets with His people. But in the future, Revelation 21.3, this is the last text I will offer you. You see that there is a consummation to this promise. Where on the one hand, Jesus says, where two or more are gathered in my name, it's a worshiping assembly, it's not just two Christians grabbing lunch, it's they've gathered in a spiritual way in the name of Christ. Jesus says, there am I in your midst. The final consummation of God's promise is in Revelation 21, 3, at the very end of all the human age. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. That's where all of this is trending toward. This, this once a week, in the Spirit, on the Lord's day, assembling according to God's command. This is all leading to the final moment of human history when God comes physically, actually, in the person of the crowned King Christ and dwells permanently with His people in grace. Let us pray together. Father God, we thank You for this time this morning that we have had in Your Word, studying, praying, thinking, being challenged as to what you think of, Lord God, when you think of the assembling of the church. So Father, hopefully we've begun to see a bit of a contrast. That you've thought of this gathering this morning so much more highly than than, than we have. You've brought your presence here in such power and we haven't anticipated it. We haven't entered in with faith or expected you to do something spectacular in our lives and in our midst. You've commissioned angels. You've stationed them here in our midst to bear witness to the worship of your people. And yet, Father, far too often, we think so little thoughts about your assembly that we wake up some Sundays and say, well, will I bother or not? For that, we need to repent. Father, help us, informed by your word, charged by your spirit and grace. Help us. 
to think thoughts about this gathered assembly like you do. To think your thoughts after you. To appreciate, to properly estimate what the gathering of the saints is in your eyes, Lord God, so that we can duly appreciate it in our own. We ask your grace upon this gathered assembly. May we sing this next song with, a, with, a, with an element of triumph and glory because you are here in our midst in a very real and powerful way. We thank you for God. We thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name.